Starting with the examiner this morning, and uh, it's a great picture of John Myler at the Cliffs of Moher. On the edge, John Myler fears the growing <coughs> demands on elite GAA players. He's um, dressed, he's, a, he's the archetypal mammal, a middle-aged man in Lycra, but he can actually wear it quite well because uh, he, is, he was in the office yesterday. He is fit as a whippet. So the Wild Atlantic Way Cycle Sportif was being launched yesterday. That interview's going to happen Friday? Friday, yep. <coughs> and uh, he's in good form? Very good form, yeah. He's... Very good chat, obviously previewing the weekend and kind of reminisces on his uh, childhood in Wexford and brings up my all-time favourite hurling team, even though I was none of us ever saw them, was that double winning team of 56 and 57 in Wexford. And he mentions uh, the likes of Art Foley and Ned Wheeler, who oh, of yes. course used to be on the show. He, he, uh, like I don't want to give away too much, but he tells like a great story of Ned Wheeler he used to drive a milk van, stopping off... Uh, at Myler's house and pucking a ball around with him in the front garden and going off about his business again for the rest of the day. It's, right, okay. it's a brilliant, brilliant story. No need for Hunger Games and the Gavin Guide to Ongoing Success. This is uh, the always entertaining Mike Quirk today. Yeah, he's comparing Jim Gavin to Brooks Kepka. that we're not going to get uh, the Tiger Woods level of enthusiasm uh, around Jim Gavin, but it is... Has a big chip on his shoulder because he doesn't get the courage, uh, the coverage and credit he deserves? Well, in fairness to work, he, he doesn't mention any chips on shoulders, and I don't think he does have a, a chip on his shoulder. What he does mention is just the complete absence of ego that is kind of frustrating almost from a media perspective or from a neutral perspective when it comes to watching him speak. But that is ultimately why they're so incredibly successful. Uh, there's a couple of other good lines uh, in the piece as well which uh, kind of escaped my mind right now. Okay, well, I'll give you two there. But So if he, um, if Brooks Kupka is, in this analogy, Jim Gavin, does that make Kerry Tiger Woods? Well, well he, Woods it, great. Implicitly. Now, a creely a shadow of their former selves, celebrating mediocrity. On the way back. Uh, do, do fans appreciate Kepka's game? Of course they do. Do they love him like Tiger? No chance. Uh, which is, is a fair point. That doesn't mean that you can't appreciate how good Kepka is. And also... As I said yesterday, I kind of took an instant liking to Brooks Kepka, but I think most people, it's been a slow burn with them that this kind of uh, deep resentment kind of turns to appreciation. And like the, he also talks, interestingly here, about the hunger theory, that like if you talk about the Dublin team of 15 years ago, it was like, well, they haven't won in All-Ireland since 95. They're hungry, they're going to have more hunger than anybody else. And blah, that's blah, blah. why <laughs> Sam Maguire changed hands, because... Hunger as bullshit as momentum. Well, that, that's it. And that's what Mike Quirk is saying here. It's, momentum is not a bullshit thing, but anyway. Um, Jim Gavin, he says, is doing something very deliberate with Dublin that has eradicated the notion of winning, makes you less driven for the future, which is very true, that the idea was that Dublin were hungry because they hadn't won in All-Ireland since 1995. Jim Gavin has turned that on its head. They are hungry because they've won the last three All-Irelands and that they're striving for gold and that they are striving to be the best. That they seemingly invest huge time and energy into trying to create more of a player-led environment as well, which kind of uh, feeds into this idea why they can figure out games so well when it's in the melting pot, the, the likes of those Mayo games over the last couple of years, where that is also part of the absence of ego, where the management don't need to feel like they're controlling every little part of it. The players have as much of a say in the, in the conversations that are important around the team. So it's a good, it's a good piece again by, by Mike Quirk. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest threat to Dublin is that their management team breaks up and that somebody comes in and goes, no, it's my way or the highway and we're going to go back to doing what it is that made Dublin great in the first place. None of this fannying about ticky tack nonsense. And that is the really only threat that you can see to their dominance. And there's no way at this point in in the cycle that Jim Gavin is going to leave and if he does you would expect that Dublin is so well run at the moment that they would appoint from within that current management setup or so Desi Farrell was obviously involved with the under 21s as they were like somebody who knows the group and will come in and go well this all seems to be working quite well um, maybe we're not going to make too many changes to it. Well, that's the thing, and you would I can't believe we're talking about successors to Jim Gavin, but if, uh, if that were to occur, um, Desi Farrell is your man, because he seems or like... Jay a, Jason Sherlock, or Jason yeah. Sherlock. Or Jason Sherlock, perfect shot, actually. It's just a matter of, we can... Jim Gavin could win five in a row, step away, and Dublin would then win seven in a row, just from the groundwork that Jim Gavin has laid down. If Sherlock is there or Desi Farrell is there, it's just a matter of saying, well, green light, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. And um, like, I, like we're talking about seven in a row, we're talking about Jim Gavin stepping away, we're getting into wild rounds of speculation here, but you know, maybe it's all going to happen. Uh, so McInerney's final green light, the Independent this morning reporting that Garrow McInerney is fit and ready to go for the All-Ireland Hurling final this coming weekend. They also have Ireland's James Scully starting the final of the men's 200 metre freestyle in the um, day one of the World Paris Swimming Championships, which are taking place in Dublin. Sorry, the World 
para swimming European Championships. So the European Championships are here. Johan van Graan was doing press yesterday. Loads of interesting stuff coming out of that. In particular, the, the notion that most of the Ireland players won't be available for long stretches of this season. Um, so it's a World Cup year. Yeah, we're wrapping everybody up in cotton wool, and then they'll be horribly undercooked by the time the World Cup rolls around. Well, I'm looking forward to the hearing all the comments about this from all the camps that aren't Leinster over the next couple of weeks. They'll all be saying to themselves, ah, it's fine, you know, Ireland comes first, because well aware of the fact that Leinster are going to be the ones that are going to get killed Three lads after training. Exactly. Uh, so Van Grand doesn't seem too disappointed about that. He, he knows what the story is. He knows what the structure is. Uh, I can, even if it was all things being equal, each province having the exact same amount of players in the Ireland camp, I think the way Ireland are going at the moment, you just kind of have to put your hands up and say, right, for this one season, go ahead. Just do it. Give it a lash. If you're not going to make a World Cup semi-final at this stage, you are never going to do it. This is the greatest team we've ever had. This is the greatest structure potentially we've ever had at an elite level. And there is the greatest support from the public. Just go and do it. And then never talk to me again if you don't reach that World Cup semi-final. Uh, great story from Brian Kyo in the back of the Irish Independent. Uh, who do you think is Ireland's third... Highest paid golfer this year? Uh, the caddy for Brooks Koepka. Hey, you've already read the story. Okay, so Ricky Elliott is his name. Um, he could be online to make about a million quid this year, which might make him actually the second uh, highest Irish earning golfer of the year. McElroy has 3.6 million already. Shane Larry's on 700 grand. Needs to do really well in this, the last tournament that he can uh, possibly keep his car card. But he's already picked up 10% of the 2 million for the US PGA and 2 million for the US Open. So that's 400 grand right there. And then another percentage of the 6 and 6.4 million that Kupka's won outside of that 4 million. So he's already made 10 million this year, Kupka. There's another uh, wheelbarrow load of money to be made in the uh, FedEx playoffs to come. And in the form Bros Kupka's in at the minute, you wouldn't back against him winning the 10 million quid, which would be a million quid in a day for him. So, yeah, it's not incredible. bad. It is incredible. Suddenly people are like, yeah, I wouldn't mind being a caddy. What wasn't... Um Williams, the highest paid New Zealand sports person at one stage? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, Steve Williams, the uh, Cardi Tiger Woods. That, that story definitely did the rounds, and then a bunch of people debunked it, so, you know. Well, yeah, true. it's 100% true. R R Richie McCall, while sweeping the shed, was like, I'm not having that. Yeah, breaking the brush over his knee. Uh, Greek tragedy, Celtics Champions League Odyssey to end in Athens. The Racing Post this morning are saying that AEK Athens are going to knock Celtic out of the Champions League qualifiers tonight. Woods 12 to 1 for the Masters after major near miss. Is 12 to 1 now about Tiger for next year's Masters good or horribly bad and a waste of money? <sighs> horribly bad and a waste of money, I would say, no? I mean, is 12, he, 12 is to he, 1 isn't extraordinary odds this far out from the fit? I don't know if he's going to be fit. That's the thing. Like, worst case scenario, he goes into 9 to 1. Like, I'd rather take 9 to 1 the week of the Masters than 12 to 1 now. Yeah. For God's sake. Handicapper Awesome. Alpha is out on her own. Handicapper Awesome. No, Handicapper Awesome Alpha is out on her own. <laughs> so, Alpha Centuri is officially the best three year old Irish filly since Ridgewood Pearl 23 years ago. So, you're witnessing history every time uh, Alpha Centuri runs, and we're not quite sure what her next move is going to be, according to the. Um, papers this morning and a quick look at the Irish news before we get to the tabloids for you. A decade of frustration drove us to a final spot, says Hart and Rogers, saddened by Boyata situation. Uh, we've also got the Mayo news for you this morning. The big news in GAA is that Rochford confirms his return. So that's the story on the Mayo news. They're breaking that this morning and it's carried as well in um, the Irish Indo and a couple of other newspapers too. So Stephen Rochford is coming back. Not that much of a surprise. It would have been very interesting to see if Jim McGuinness had been given a run at this Mayo team to see what would have happened. It's not going to happen. I don't think anybody can um, begrudge Stephen Rochford another spin of the dice. The talk yesterday was about 2020 though, wasn't it? For, For Jim McGuinness. I mean, come on. He's going to have another job by He's then. He's going to have another job by then, probably. But This is 2018. Yeah. Oh, it'll take you in two years' time, Jim. Well, it'll be this time next year he'd get ratified. For the for the twenty twenty season, Jim. But like talking about that a year out is, as you say, there's September a lot of variables. next year after they win the All Ireland and stuff well, five in a row. That's the thing. What what do you do actually if you're Stephen Rochford? Do you step down after the greatest achievement? You win in an Ireland. Yeah, you win. Oh, an Ireland. you keep going for like keep ten going. years. Job for life, lads. You you like you are an automatic legend. And I guess, I guess there is kind of a possibility that if they or maybe you do to, step down. I don't know. There's always this sense that you step down, you shouldn't have because. Actually, like, Liam Sheedy stepped down and, okay, so he's got a very busy life and that's fair enough and they had won the All-Ireland they'd stopped the five in a row. But, like, that tip team chronically underperformed. 
the, afterwards. Did Jim McGuinness's legacy get damaged by staying on with Donegal? No, is what I would say. So you have that banked. Oh, like, they should have won another All Ireland. Yeah, but but that doesn't. I don't think anybody says like Jim McGuinness became a bad manager or no. That 2012 it was, Ireland was lucky. It was totally worth it. Yeah, for him saying I'm because then like, I mean, if the goalkeeper doesn't kick the ball, to Donaghy, they're probably going to be Kerry that day. Yeah, there's a lot of other variables. A lot of other stuff happened in that game as well, Ger. Um, let's move on to the Irish. Actually, nothing else happened in that game. It was like nothing else happened. Yeah, it was one goal to nil. I forgot. <laughs> uh, back page of the Irish Daily Mail this morning is Johnny B. Good. Collins reckons Glynn is key to Galway hopes. So that's the former Galway captain David Collins talking about Johnny Glynn. It seems that he wants him to just stand in on the edge of the square and play full forward. The high ball into Johnny Glynn is going to be utilised in some way, you'd imagine, on Sunday, whether or not that's going to be from the puck out or whether or not it's going to be an offensive tactic. Johnny Glynn is all of the newspapers too because um, David Collins is saying he's going to have to make a decision about his commuting from New York. He's still flying back and forth. He works in construction in New York and apparently has a really good job and uh, is also one of the best hurlers in Galway at the moment and is leading this dual life, which can't be easy. It's an incredible situation, isn't it? It's so unique. I presume he's like... Flying business holiday. class? Well, I, I would like to think, I'm full, sure. Full stretch? Ah. Is I'm it, sure. Or is it like cramped? Like the SNC coach in Galway would have a fit if this guy was cramped into like a Norwegian Gosh. Airlines flight every single week. But I presume he's like on an extended leave from his construction job at the moment. No, I don't think so. No? I don't know. I mean, uh, I think he's back and forth. So certainly that was the, the implication was that Collins was on the phone to him and he was in the airport heading back after a recent game. Right, okay. That's mad. Like that's... It, it, it's it's huge kind of commitment from Galway to actually give Johnny Glynn this kind of seal of approval. But then, when you're as good as Johnny Glynn, and when you can be as when you can dictate an entire plan as yeah. Johnny Glynn can do, then I guess he does kind of gravitate that way, and he has that amount of importance. The other story, by the way, on the back of the Irish Daily Mail this morning that we want to bring you is this Mo Salah uh, story. Liverpool report Salah to police. So just have a look at this video. I'm a Salah. Heck yeah, come on. I got it, babe. The car is not stopped. Is the car stopped? It is stopped, but it is uh, in traffic. I think we'll see it move along now in a moment. Oh, yeah. He is horrible. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, commentary's class. What? Wait for it. Get this boot. Come on, Mo. Is a boot behind me? Come on, Mo. Mo? Too much money. Too much money. What? That is the line. <laughs> I mean, he's in traffic. No. I, uh, I sure hope it's not the same guy who had that run-in with Jamie Carragher no. on the motorway. Um, but basically, as you can see there, Mo Salah is using his phone while driving a car, and Liverpool have reported him to the Merseyside Police. Uh, we've spoken to the player, that says the police, uh, and will deal with any follow-up internally. So neither the club nor player will be making any further comment on this matter. Uh, and sorry, the police then say, that was Liverpool, we made aware of a video belief to show a footballer using a mobile phone while driving. This has been passed to the relevant department. So uh, Liverpool screwing their own man over there. He probably would have got reported by somebody anyway. What do you think of this? Liverpool have been forced to act. They've kind of got it. They, they have to be seen to do something at this point. Well, right? they didn't have to report it to the police. They could have said... Oh, we've asked Mo to stop doing this. Uh, but actually reporting to the police is quite a serious, like... It means, you have to assume it means points on his licence, right? For sure. And uh, didn't, didn't Salah have, like, uh, some tweets of when he arrived? He was like, oh, I need to remember to drive on the right side of the road. Uh, so maybe what they're actually doing is just protecting their asset here. It's like, if you are on your phone while driving and it's slow, maybe you might also be on your phone while driving when it's fast. And who knows where that leads to. Um, you know, bad things happen to people who drive with mobile phones. Yes. And you're very important to us, Mo. So we're actually protecting you from yourself. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm reading too much into this. It might be just a simple matter of player welfare. I think they're doing, I think they're doing the right thing, you know? It's like, I think this is a sign of a, a club who are at it. You know? Like Arsenal in the good old days when David Dean was there in the marble halls of Highbury. Like, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were about. It was well run. It's like, no, you can't step out of line like that. 
So when we look back on Liverpool winning the Premier League season... That's the moment right there. That was the moment. Too much money, Mo. Too much money. Uh, I, 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 love the, I love that commentary there. It's, it's fantastic. It's like, well, like would, you, would you sign the autograph of your Mo? I mean, is, it, is it more dangerous to sign an oh, autograph totally, for the yeah, movie yeah. card no, than, than using your phone? He's right not to sign the autograph for that guy. Back page of the Irish Daily Star this morning is PSG in 110 million euro Eric Raid. So Spurs are facing a fight to keep Dane as French Giants plan swoop. So, of course, the transfer window hasn't closed for European teams. Ericsson could be on the way out if uh, Spurs accept that offer. Imagine if Spurs do accept that <laughs> offer. What if, if Daniel Levy, just behind Pochettino's back, is like, yes, Woo-hoo! please. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine what Pochettino would react like. Christian, uh, we're, we're going to go for a little weekend in Paris. <laughs> oh, it's very romantic. <laughs> Oh my God! It will it will be hilarious. It would just be it, it will be the worst transfer window by any competitive team in the Premier League ever. Uh, the news also broke yesterday that they're not going to get into White Hart Lane. Yes, as early as they expected. So back to Wembley for a bunch of home games, and it's like just it's not quite the season that he had planned or I'm sure envisaged in his head. No, uh, Ericsson, of course hasn't has failed to sign that new contract. This is where things start to get tricky for Spurs. They didn't look good at Saturday, on Saturday either. I'm not sure if you watched that. I watched a bit of it, yeah. They, the, first, the first half was really good, and then the second half, I might have fallen asleep. Well, Newcastle should have equalised, is the, the bottom line here. And I, like immediately there are signs that Spurs may not be able to mount a, a title challenge once again this year. And if that doesn't happen, then what happens? I think that winning at Newcastle is going to be a good three points. I don't think everybody's going to win at St James Park. It, pro- it probably is. No, in fairness, it probably is. But in terms of some, some leakages at the back, let's just say, there was, uh, there was a few moments that made me think, you know, this isn't going to be Spurs' year once again. Um, a couple of other stories for you, particularly when it comes to football. Uh, utter rubbish, says the back of the mirror. Former England boss Big Sam slams Emery for Gunners' tactics after opening day defeat to Pep's champions. So this is interesting stuff from uh, Big Sam. He says, it's the manager's fault for their defeat to Manchester City. Don't ask someone to do against Manchester City what you can't do. So this is in relation to playing the ball out of the back. Uh, What do City do? They press, press, press. So why do you try to play out? Even the Arsenal crowd cheered when they dropped one in the opposition's half. Uh, Bitter attack there on uh, Wenger's successor, Unai Emery. It's uh, probably a little bit too soon to be saying that they're utter rubbish. But uh, he has got blasted, and that's the, that's the nature of uh, Big Sam and uh, kind of wielding his words in the media at the moment. Utter rubbish and blasted. Uh, back page of the Herald this morning is Jack's Sky High Blues, McCaffrey Lord's new dubs pushing for places. Uh, Griffith says we can cope with the pressure as well for that AK Athens against Celtic match. Uh, and then the Sun goes with that Celtic story as well. I feel sorry for Boyata's teammates. And Pogba Barca poser. Move talk, not silenced. So this is the story that rumbles on and on and on. Barcelona have still refused to rule out a move for Manchester United's Paul Pogba. A couple of articles doing the rounds as well this morning, wondering if Paul Pogba will get the permanent captaincy at Manchester United, which will kind of be a, a full seal of approval, of approval from Jose Mourinho. But that's not necessarily what Paul Pogba wants. Like, does he... Uh, maybe he does. Maybe he does. Maybe that's all he wants. Just a bit. Everybody wants to be loved a bit. That's all. Like and the armband, no, nothing better than being loved a bit uh, by giving you the armband. One other story that caught my eye inside in the sun uh, this morning is one about Bernardo Silva. Like the reporter here, Martin Blackburn, has clearly spoken to a few of uh, Bernardo Silva's former teammates, and they haven't exactly been uh, kind of glowing in praise, but they have been. But they've kind of said some very strange things. Like Guillermo Matos says Bernardo paid to play for Benfica when he joined through the schools. Which is like, uh, yeah, this guy paid his way up through the ranks. Uh, when he still struggled to break into the youth team, his friends started a campaign to get him picked by the manager. Another former teammate then said they even brought a placard to training saying, play Bernardo. By the following year, Bernardo was the number 10 with the same coach. The placard helped, so he can be grateful to his friends for that. There's a couple of old Portuguese friends trying to hop on the Bernardo Silva bandwagon. Like There's a couple of, there's a couple of uh, lines here as well saying, from João Moutinho actually, who's of course now at Wolves, said, I can see Bernardo approaching the level of Messi, Eusebio, Maradona and Pele. All right. 24 nice. years old, is it too late to make that sort of burst? No, not really. Um, so Modern medicine these days makes people develop in different ways. Yeah, so I've heard. It's good stuff. Uh, front page of the Daily Telegraph sports section, Tiger set loose on Europe, the 14-time major winner's miraculous return to form to be rewarded with a place on the US team. And then finally, the back page of The Guardian is Stokes out. England named same squad for third test, but doors left open. We've also got this one. Uh, Fighting helped me find myself. I found a purpose and that my presence on earth matters. That's UFC's Paige Van Zandt on dealing with the trauma of her youth.